so I think Anna did a pretty good job of giving an overview of the National Financial Capability Study. We work with the uh, FINRA Investor Education Foundation, with Anna and with others, to design and field and analyze the National Financial Capability Study. So it's filled with all sorts of interesting and useful measures. Uh, sometimes the challenge is to figure out how do you boil it all down so that you can do some interesting and useful analyses. So one analysis that we wanted to do was to take all of these measures of financial literacy, all these measures of financial capability, try to boil them down into sort of single scalar measures so that we could admittedly, somewhat simplistically, give every single respondent in the data set a single score for their financial literacy, a single score for their financial capability, and that way we could aggregate across respondent populations and, and do various analyses, demographic analyses, and then uh, what we've been talking about here today, geographic analyses as well. Uh, so the financial literacy index, this one was relatively simple, straightforward to do. Uh, we have a core battery of five financial literacy questions that Anna and Olivia have worked on over the years uh, to measure, uh, to, to give a basic core measure of financial literacy. And uh, the financial capability index is a little bit trickier. The whole survey, uh, presumably, it deals with financial capability. And the idea of financial capability is multifaceted. So we had to make some very simplifying moves in order to create a single index. And you'll see in my final slide of this presentation that one of the things we'd really like to do going forward in the years ahead is to try to construct a more sophisticated, more nuanced, more meaningful, useful financial capability index that tries to summarize and give appropriate weight to all the various elements that comprise financial capability. So what I'm going to be doing in this presentation is I'll, I'll just quickly touch on the construction of these two measures, but then I'm really going to focus on an analysis we did to compare those measures on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, the National Financial Capability Study, one of its distinguishing features is that it's a really large data set. We, we designed it uh, from the start to have a sufficient sample for every state and the District of Columbia so that we do these kinds of analyses. So it's got something on the order of 28,000 respondents in it. Uh, from the initial wage we did in 2009. Uh, so what we wanted to do in this paper, and, and I don't know if we included the paper in the uh, in this folder or not, but, but we co-authored a paper with Anna to uh, to do this analysis. And what we wanted to find first was to what degree do these measures of financial literacy and financial capability correlate with real-world meaningful measures on a state-by-state -state basis? Things like unemployment or poverty or I'll show you the results of that. Uh, but we also wanted to see, was there something going on on a state-by-state -state basis that explains variations in literacy and capability beyond demographic differences? Was there something that maybe then you could hypothesize could be attributed to policy uh, effects above and above beyond the demographic differences uh, from state to state? So, all right, let's go to the Financial Literacy Index. The five measures, I think most of you are probably familiar uh, with these questions that have been used in many surveys, not just in the states, but abroad as well. Uh, what we did was we created a very simple uh, concept, which was to give you a point for every correct answer, and you got no point if you got an incorrect or don't know answer. And you can see the distribution here across the entire data set of the score people got from zero to five uh, on financial literacy. So with armed with that very simple measure, so we gave you know, equal value given to each question, no distinguishing between don't knows and incorrect. So you know, a lot of, you can certainly quibble with and tinker with the with the design, uh, but we wanted to start somewhere, and that gives us a map where we've divided the states into quintiles. So 20% of the states are coded with blue for having the highest average financial literacy score across all the respondents in that state. We go on down to the red states, which have the bottom quintile of average financial literacy scores. This is not corrected for demographics. So this is the raw average measure. But each sample, state by state sample, we uh, set quotas to make sure that we were getting pretty close to the demographic makeup of each state. And then we apply some weighting to make it more precise based on census measures. So you can see some patterns here. The lower financial literacy states tend to be clustered towards the east. You might be surprised to see some states like New York and Pennsylvania where there is quite low financial literacy. Um, uh, but you know, it's sort of it's scattered about. You, you know, any number of, of, of the results may surprise you. The fact that California has higher financial literacy than, for example, Virginia. 
uh, some of these things may seem counterintuitive. Uh, now let me talk a little bit about this broader measure of financial capability. Uh, the survey has four core areas to address financial capability. One is uh, making ends meet. Essentially, it's a measure of whether you're saving or not. Uh, then we have a whole series of questions having to do with, the, to, with, with uh, planning behaviors. Are you saving for retirement? Are you even thinking about retirement? Liquidity measures, like you have a rainy day fund. Uh, a lot of measures having to do with your engagement with various financial products and services, usage of, you get your usage of certain types of basic products like banking, uh, usage of expensive borrowing products, alternative financial uh, products, uh, and then also we have a battery of credit card behaviors, uh, some of which you can pretty objectively judge to be adverse from the original of paying the fees. And then finally, literacy itself is a component of financial capability. So what we did here is we selected a small number of questions representing each of these areas. I think it was only a total of seven different, seven different questions. We picked ones where we thought it would be fairly non-controversial that we could objectively say, here's a good behavior, here's a bad behavior, or here's a good indication of financial capability, here's an indication of poor financial capability. A lot of the measures in the survey would probably be subject to a little bit more debate about the, the valence of their meaning, but we, uh, we, we tried to pick ones that we thought were, uh, were, were reasonably safe. Uh, again, I think this is an area where it would be terrific if we have a multidisciplinary group who could kick around some ideas for a while and try to create a more nuanced measure. But we ended up with this distribution, a much wider distribution than the financial literacy distribution, because for each of these questions, you could earn a plus one or a minus one, or a zero. Uh, so you see a fairly wide distribution from uh, all the way from minus six to plus six, uh, and reasonably uniform in the, in the middle zone. So a lot of good variation here, with a mean score coming pretty close to zero. So let's look at the map that we get from this. Here again, we've divided by quintiles. And there's some similarity to the financial literacy map, but there's some really glaring differences. Let me call your attention to New York. New York was in the bottom quintile for financial literacy. It's in the top quintile for financial capability. So even though, on average, New Yorkers uh, did, more, did poorly on answering some basic questions about interest rate compounding and, uh, and mortgages and, and, and the like, when you, take, when you take a look at their actual performance on dealing with financial projects, planning for retirement, they're in the, in the top fifth. Does that have something to do with their demographics? Is it something to do with policy? Um, a lot of hypotheses spring to mind. Georgia is another state where we see a bit of a flip, not quite as extreme. They went from low on financial literacy to, uh, to high on uh, financial capability. Virginia made a similar flip. Uh, there are some states that went the other way. So, uh, all right, that's enough of sort of understanding these basic measures we created, and now let's get to the analysis, the, the analysis of, of uh, what's going on that might be driving some of these variations, or, or do they have any you know, meaningful real-world consequences? So, the first thing that we wanted to look at, and this was an idea suggested by Sly and Lydia, actually, is to see, do these variations by state in financial literacy and financial capability correlate with other measures in those states that we all know to be important for economic reasons and for well-being reasons. So we took a look at publicly available measures of five different indications of what you could you know, think of as objective measures of financial capability uh, in states. We looked at poverty levels, foreclosure rates, unemployment, bankruptcy, and the percent of population on public assistance. And we ran regressions to see if uh, financial literacy or financial capability co uh, correlated significantly with these. What we learned was of those five measures, only one of them, uh, correlated with either financial literacy score of the state or financial capability, and that was poverty. But here we did see a, a significant uh, relationship between a state's literacy level and capability level and the poverty level, a negative correlation. Here's a chart just to show a scattered chart to show uh, for financial literacy the, uh, the pattern, which is somewhat visible, it's visible to the naked eye, and there's a trend line. Uh, and then slightly better fit for financial capability, similar pattern here. So, you know, obviously it's not a perfect fit, but it's, you know, there's something going on here uh, that, that, that links these concepts. 
The other analysis we wanted to do then was to try to understand what was the underlying driver of these state-by-state -state differences. Uh, and partly it's because we want to know, is there any indication that there might be a policy difference? Or really, can you explain the variations because of differing demographic distributions? Uh, and so what we did was uh, we constructed a model where we included demographic variables in which gender ethnicity, income, education, marital status, into the, in the first block of the regression, and then we made dummy variables for the states. Uh, and what we found was that geography alone doesn't have a lot of explanatory power. In other words, all those variations that we saw by state, or not all, but a great deal of the variation can be explained by demographic differences, uh, and you're left over with a tiny little contribution uh, to the R squared from the financial literacy or the financial capability measure. So, uh, you know, the, the hypothesis that we come away from here is uh, if you think of the states as a laboratory for experimentation, uh, either they're not doing much in terms of varied approaches to financial literacy, uh, or the experiments that they've engaged in haven't had much of an effect. Uh, so, so you know, it, it suggests to me that we, if we, we could spend some time looking at state-by-state -state variations of policy, and it's probably still worth doing, but we shouldn't be shocked if we do that and find that there's not a heck of a lot of difference going on in terms of how they're approaching the subjects of, of literacy and capability. There are, are a few states that we saw a significant impact on financial literacy, but it's only a handful, and the effects are pretty small. So South Dakota and Idaho, uh, even the correcting for demographics, you're still you're more likely to have higher financial literacy in those states, and you're more likely to have lower financial literacy in Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, these East Coast states. So remember that first chart we looked at where New York was one of the lowest quintile states for financial literacy. Um, you know, and, and this sort of confirms that even when you uh, correct for the demographic makeup, of New York State, there's still something else going on in New York that, uh, that contributes to a lower financial literacy. On the financial capability side, only two states had a significant contribution upward or downward to financial capability after correcting for, uh, for demographics, Georgia and Hawaii. So that could be a fluke, or maybe it's worth looking to see if those states are doing something to the succeeding or failing to promote financial capability. So let me just wrap up with, with a couple of notes on next steps. Uh, in two, this year and beyond, uh, one of the most important next steps we're taking is that we're again collaborating with the Finner Investor Education Foundation and, and others to launch a second wave of financial capabilities that we're actually really close to programming and going into the field after about six months of working on refining uh, and improving the, the, uh, the instrument. Uh, so we'll be, we'll be fielding that over the course of the summer into the early fall, doing analysis in the fall and winter. And we expect to have some top line results at the beginning of 2013. So what we're hoping we can do here as part of the Financial Literacy Center going forward is you know, we'd like to update these geographic indices, see if there are any changes in 2009. What we'd really like to do, as I said before, is develop a more sophisticated financial capability index. I mean, we, we all talk about financial capability. We all recognize that it's a complex, multifaceted concept. I think it would be great if we could try to discipline ourselves to create some definition around financial capability, even to the point of trying to boil it down to a scale or measure. Uh, but I think it's going to require input from a lot of people, practitioners, theoreticians, uh, even policymakers, perhaps. Um, and it would be nice to see also, of course, if any changes that happened between 2009 and 2012, any of the changes that we see in measures of literacy and capability really correlate uh, or clash with shifts that we see in those external measures of well-being in the states. Thank you.